in. All right. So we're back in action. Sorry about that. So level, again, level series. Um, breaks are really one of the only things at Instagram where we have to take away features uh, to lower that price. And so while an XX1 and a GX um, group set all have pretty much the same features, um, the G2, you're going to get more features as you go up. So our um, guide T is pretty much just a straight break. I'm uh, going to find on lower end bikes. Rental fleets is an awesome brake, great power. Guide R, we move up to a reach adjustment. Then we have our guide RE, some of you guys might have seen. Now, guide RE was built um, for our folks in the electric market with a heavier um, code caliper on our guide lever. Then we go up to the guide RS. And so RS, we're going to integrate the swing link, which we'll talk about a little bit later. I thought that had a uh, thing. We're going to integrate the swing link, which we'll talk about a little bit later when we get into this guy. And then RSC, and RSC is going to integrate a contact um, adjust. And so that's where our final bite is on the lever. And so that's really super important for riding big mountains, right? Once your brakes nice and snappy when you're riding technical trails, but at the end of a long day, you want to be able to dial that guy back and just hold on for dear life. That's where that contact point really comes in handy. And then this one, the guide ultimate, Carbon lever and tie hardware. And so um, the thing I like about carbon lever, and this may sound crazy, but I kind of figured it out on accident. I had a guide RSC on one hand and a guide ultimate on the other. And so that lever, being that carbon is an insulator, right? It doesn't transfer heat um, versus aluminum, which transfers heat really well, right? 200 watts per meter Kelvin. Um, your finger doesn't get cold. And so people living in cold temperatures, that carbon lever is actually kind of a nice feature. Um, and then our last one, and of course, the big boy of the group, oops, the code. And so you can see much larger reservoir, um, a little bit more uh, leverage. And uh, again, most of its advantages come at the caliper and that big burly code caliper. So again, e-bikes, really great for downhill bikes, again, intended use, but people that want the strongest brake, you're seeing a lot on Enduro 29ers, um, that code is the way to go. So code R, no uh, contact adjust, and the code RSC with contact adjust. All right. Now, how do these things work? Let's get into the inner workings of our brakes as well as a few of the other features. And so brakes, you need a lot of plastic widgets, right? All kinds of things to move the pistons and the calipers and the spacers and to space the pads when you're moving around and to open the pistons when you're bleeding it or replacing pads. And so a lot of these plastic widgets, but they all have a function, including this new one. They all have a function. And so let's go through what some of these guys do and how they affect um, the bleed as well as the installation process. So when you get your brakes, you will notice that they often come with a pad spacer, right? That's this guy. And so all he's doing is keeping your um, pad and in shipping, right? So people can advance those pistons. But they're also serving another purpose. They're allowing you to set the um, <clears throat> distance between those pistons. And so we'll talk about that in a second. But really important that when you're setting up our red axis, um, especially in the monoblock caliper, so this is the two-piece caliper, that we're using that 2.4 or even 2.7 pad spacer um, to set those pistons before we load that um, rotor in there. But on our mountain bike, you'll see that one is at 1.8, the exact um, width of our mountain bike um, caliper, of our mountain bike rotor. The next one you'll see are guys like this. So this is going to be guide, this is going to be um, guide ultimate, and then this will work on our road. This is to set our pistons. And when I mean set our pistons, this is going to move our pistons back in the bore so that we get the right amount of volume 
of fluid inside of our system, okay? And so if you were to bleed a system with the pads completely worn out and the pistons all the way in, you could overfill the system. That's not the best, right? And, um, you know, overfilling the system, it's not all bad because when you went to put in some new pads, you might have to, like, let some fluid out or they wouldn't push all the way back in. But the risk you run is having extra room behind our piston allows for air bubbles to hide. And so a big thing at SRAM is we want to make your job as a mechanic, right, the most efficient possible. So things like our um, bleeding edge valve. And so bleeding edge, again, will hook to our bleeding edge syringe. And so really taking that bleed screw and the mess out from the caliper, okay? And so now you can see what that does. It opens up a path, allows our fluid to easily move through these engineered pathways, flush out all the air, and start heading up um, the hose uh, towards that towards that lever assembly, all right? So that's really what your bleeding edge is doing. And I've got this question a lot of times, well, it works so well right there, how come you don't put it on the lever also? Well, and the reason being there is we just talked about that overfill situation. If some fluid is good, more must be better. And so what we would get is, oh, I'm gonna squirt this thing full and then turn that. No, we want this to be at ambient pressure when we're done with our bleed so that we have room for expansion of our fluid, right, in that bladder. So <clears throat> that's kind of what these little plastic widgets do um, with the exception of this guy. And so you guys might have seen some bikes coming with that guy plugged up, right, and making that connectamajig hole keeping that thing nice and clean. And then this guy, screwed on here, maybe, and that guy inside there. And so really what we have here um, is the ability to, oh, that's because I lost that little cap, is the ability to cap off our perfectly bled system. And it comes with a little guy like this send it to our assembly houses and let them drag it through the frame with this specially um, designed little frame dragger. This guy then will remove that guy. Important to notice that is a reverse thread and then you put this guy on there, right? For some reason, when we came out with this newer um, olive and barb system, people wanted to put it on like this. So we call that the wine cup, but we're not getting any compression over that guy. And so while for a many of you seasoned mechanics, this isn't really a very necessary tool. It did become necessary, however, for um, bikes that were shipping directly to the consumer or for build houses to drag that cable through um, a lot of road bikes, right? So that's important, those two little plastic guys. And then inside here, is what we call connect them a jig and so just like your air hose fitting this guy goes in there right and we're connected and then when he comes out this guy is then uh sealed so connect them a jig started right there ladies and gentlemen awesome welcome okay well we're just cruising um and let's get into the actual functionality, shall we, of our brake system. Now let's talk some more about olives. Um, let's talk some more about compression uh, fittings. So our compression nut um, that is behind that olive, right? We know him and he looks like, just had one. We know him and he looks like something. Um, that's a very important fork. And so anytime we are connecting our um, our brakes using that compression nut, we're gonna wanna use not only um, a line wrench, um, line wrenches are important because they're gonna grab that fitting on more than just two sides. Um, because those guys are hollow, they like to wallow. No, 
because they're hollow, um, to get to that eight newton meters of torque, you wouldn't quite achieve that um, unless you get purchase on all sides of that nut, okay? And so that's why we include that crow's foot in all of our pro bleed kits. But more importantly, that crow's foot is, has the ability for us getting to that eight newton meters, right, with our torque wrench. And so our old brakes, 5.6. Our new brakes with connecting the jig, eight newton meters, okay? So very important that that's followed throughout um, the system. Only caveat to that, and I think we could change it. The only caveat to that is when you're going into our road calipers, right? They have the uh, non-banjo fitting. They have a compression nut at the caliper. That one is back to 5.6. Why? I don't know, but that one's back to 5.6. So torque values, again, on brakes, we like to call them safety equipment. Um, super important. So eight newton meters. And any of you guys in the shop today, do me a favor. Take your torque wrench out, cruise around the shop. And anybody that's ever listened to any of my talks, I do this challenge every time. Cruise around the shop and check everybody's brake pad or everybody's compression nuts. Check the Shimano, check the Tektro, check the Maguros, check everybody's and tell me what you find. Um, and I think you'll be surprised at that you're gonna find that they're pretty low. So important, important, important piece. All right, so here we go. Let's go into some other important pieces of the brake. So this is one that's often overlooked. Um, this important piece, we call this matchmaker. And so matchmakers enable us to um, clamp those guys on the bar, but more importantly, integrate our shifters, our, um, our uh, one by remotes for reverbs, etc. And these guys are asymmetrical. And so they come left or right, but important thing to know is that you can use them on either side, okay? And so a left, for me, I use on the right, but then I move my shifter one over. And so it gives you like four different possibilities um, of ergonomics. So don't forget about that. We can move those guys as well as up and down. So that's kind of cool. All right. <clears throat> so I said this was going to be a theory um, presentation. So let's get us all down with a few pieces of nomenclature. All right. So in our brake system, we obviously have a caliper, right? It's squeezing things, and we have a lever. And so the lever is a reservoir of fluid, basically a pump. And so our reservoir of fluid hangs up in this area. When we actuate our brake, we are moving this U-cup, right, past our compensation port. And so that's a really big deal. This compensation port is the difference between an open system, right? It's open. He can just he can just um, transfer fluid back and forth. So fluid would go out when it gets hot, right? As it expands, it would go in for accommodating for pad wear. Sorry, I had to have a drink. Um, to uh, compensate for pad wear. And so we have this little reservoir here, and it's full of fluid. And as we have more fluid that needs to go in here because our pistons have moved out, it can then pull this guy down. There's little baffles in here and take up that space, not letting any air, right, move in there. Speaking of air, we also put that compensating thing, uh, port on a perch. And so you can see that that perch. And so if there was any bubbles that were to hide around in here, the chances of them going up here and turning down here and cruising in, very slim. Another thing you'll see is this is a relatively large port, but the actual size is very small. And so we'll put three of those around the bore. So therefore, as that U cup passes over that compensating port, we're not chewing up this very important sealing surface. So three ports equals durability of over 1 million cycles. Now this other port that you're seeing here, this is backfilling this area. So that way, um, one of the major components of brake fluid, along with polyethylene glycol and ethyl ethyl borates, um, is a lubricant. And so 
by keeping this bore lubricated and not drawing a vacuum, right? We're drawing a little bit of a vacuum back here in the back, not drawing a vacuum in our chamber. We're keeping that guy dust and dirt free in what can be a pretty grimy environment. So our last piece here is our return spring. And so what you need to know is that return spring is returning that piston as well as helping to return um, our lever, even though in our guide platform, our lever has um, a little spring that helps it along as well. So um, lever feel, lever pull, can be manipulated by the strength of that spring. Now here's one of the real beauties of this brake here. And so we know some of the other companies have brakes that feel really good on the floor, but might have maybe an abrupt stopping point. And so SRAM's been known for having a very smooth transfer of power where maybe some of our competition, it kind of comes on right about here like a ton of bricks, but bam, right? And so we like the feel of those pads accelerating quickly onto the rotor, but as <clears throat> riders, we like the feel of a nice smooth uh, curve of power. And so what this swing link here does is it accelerates the pads quickly onto the rotor, and then you can see it gives us a pretty linear push um, when we're going in for the skid, all right? And then the last feature, again, that contact pad adjustment. As I spin this guy, you can see I'm changing where this U-cup starts. And so that U-cup, if it starts further back, you're going to get more lever throw. If it starts further forward, less lever throw. So, <clears throat> again, bleed ports on both sides. So our lever design is ambidextrous, which is nice. Um, no re-bleeding if you get a rental customer from the UK, France, Japan, uh, Australia. What other ones? Anyway, they all like to flip their brakes over. So um, that goes through quite a bit of what's going on here. But like I said in the start, what is this thing really doing? It's a pump, okay? And so we're moving fluid from here down the hose. Right, so just like this guy, if we had a, a cylinder of fluid, we're moving that fluid down the hose, and down the hose, it's going to enter into our banjo fitting and start creating pressure through these guys and advancing our pistons. This is where it gets a little tricky. Inside of this piston, we have a quad seal. Let's get a better pan, shall we? SRAM red, it is. We have a quad seal. And so that guy is square and goes all the way around and he houses our piston. And so we can see that right here. That quad seal sits in a gland, right? We can also see that guy. And it's that gland seal geometry that's so crucial to not only the radial squeeze of that piston, right? Radial squeeze, I think all of us mechanics know that as a sticky piston, right? Or one that moves too easy, so that's important. But also the radius of where that guy is getting preloaded. And so if you think of this as the piston, this is the pad, and this as that quad ring, as we move that piston, we're actually flexing that quad ring over all right, we're flexing him over. He's still gripping that piston, and it's him coming back that gives us pad retraction. So that being said, we want to make sure that all of our pistons are clean and dry and not too lubricated, right? Especially when it comes to difference in materials. And so that's really the most important piece in the caliper is maintaining that gland seal geometry so we get a perfect squeeze, but also plenty of pad retraction. So that's the miracle of pad retraction. So now that we've talked about pad retraction, let's spend a second on the pads themselves. You guys are all familiar with this guy right here, SRAM's just good old metal pad, right? This is going to come in a lot of our lower end brakes, 
because metal pads plain old last longer. But they also generate a little bit more heat. And so that being said, if we go back to our, um, our cartoon model here of brake pad, um, of brake pad power, if this was our metal pad, he might build heat a little bit faster than our organic pad, right? So our organic pad might be linear longer. And so if this is skidding right here, and this is having a sweet manual right here, you can see that in an organic pad, you're going to spend a lot longer time in that premium finger zone, right, making perfect modulation. So modulation is why we use organic. Metallic is more resistant to weather conditions. So if you ride through the mud and the rain all the time, metal is the only way to go. If you, yeah, live where I live, these metal or these um, organic pads can last, you know, a whole season as well. But as soon as they get muddy, they could be gone in one ride. That being said, when we came out with the guide coming from the Avid brakes that maybe had a bit of noise, we had to make sure this pad was perfectly quiet. And actually what we ended up with is a power curve that looked more like this. It flattens off. And so sometimes coming into really sharp corners or with heavy tires, we didn't quite have enough bite. And that's where the new power organic or this gray back pad comes into play. And so that mini code feel is really a brake pad that we now have called the Power Organic. And again, a much higher um, mu or uh, brake power. So anybody that's getting new G2 brakes is getting power pads. We also have power pads available for our level brakes. And those pads are retrofit right into our red two-piece caliper. Our red one-piece caliper still uses the level ultimate or the side post uh, pack. So I bet that's more information than you ever want to know about brake pads. But if that wasn't enough, let's talk about rotors. So obviously, we make some different sized rotors. And we make different sized rotors so that we can manipulate the uh, leverage ratio that we're achieving over those pads. I mean, over uh, that wheel, right? So a major thing we have going on here is rotor design. So you guys might remember this rotor. This guy was responsible for that turkey gobble. And the reason being is that as a brake pad goes over these holes and seals these slots, we're actually sealing a volume of air. That volume of air then heats up, right, as it moves through, and as it comes out, that's gonna outgas and make noise or start a resonance. And so we figured out that these big slots, in fact, the old like haze brakes and stuff, you can hear them coming, bzz, bzz, right? You could even feel it in your finger. But we figured out that these big slots were holding way too much air. And that was the start of our resonance. So we came out with this next one. Really nice. It's got, you know, three brake tracks, nice and concentric all the way around. It's got these dips here, right? We uh, had a Gallifer um, guys figure that out, that if we interrupt this rotor, we interrupt the forces and we get less um, deformation. And so that was integrated in there, those nice brake tracks. But what we found here is these would hold just a little bit of water. And that would make a large, loud scream um, after you went through your uh, water crossings. And so we uh, are lucky enough that our brake facility is also uh, where our suspension, our suspension facility is, Colorado, right? There's no reason to test suspension in Chicago. And the same with brakes. And so we're lucky enough to have, like, giant mountains, like, I don't know, Pikes Peak in the backyard. And we also have the Air Force Academy. So we got together with one of the Air, For Air Force's doctors of harmonic resonance and had him design some rotors. And so not only is there much more support in this rotor, right? Just a few fins. Here we've got like 12, lots of support. Um, 
but we also have longer slots or a center line all the way around this rotor. So center line rotors, obviously backward compatible, but if you look at the length of that slot, it's always, maybe I should move down here, it's always gonna be longer than the pad, okay? And so that way we always have an area for outgassing. So no matter where the pad is, there's always a place for that air to go. And so that is the best rotor we've made. It's called the Cineline, very quiet, comes in 140, comes in 160. Um, this is our CLXR, again, more of our road version, but kind of ID up, cleaned up, beautiful rotor, comes in 140, 160, then we move into 180 and our new 200, I'm sorry, 200, and then new, uh, to you, ladies and gentlemen, 220 millimeter rotors. And so, again, as we get bigger in bike, right, as we get bigger in batteries and suspension and mountains and all of those things, um, we also need more braking power. So know that that 220 is out there, and that 220 on a 2.6 29er with some codes and a Zeb is... So... <clears throat> That being said, it is currently 3.58, or wherever you are. I don't know exactly what yours is, but I've got two minutes left, and I always like to make sure I thank a few folks. I firstly want to thank all of you guys for coming. Um, I always enjoy it. We have a really cool lounge. Um, I don't think any of us really knew what to expect um, with this virtual platform, but we've been having a lot of fun over in the lounge. So check out the booth, but most importantly, come by the lounge because we've got some talent um, over there and I'm happy to dive deeper into um, some of our breaks, um, maybe go through a guide uh, R and RSC overhaul for you guys. I'm happy to do that, but um, really it's fun to have these. And like I said, I want to thank Tyler and Jim. You guys have been awesome. Um, without you, we wouldn't have this great group of like-minded individuals together. So thank you guys. And then most importantly, I want to thank you guys. And on behalf of 3,600 um, SRAM employees in nine different countries and 20 locations um, bringing you good stuff, I would like to say thank you for supporting SRAM. Be well. Create a great day. And then come on over to the lounge and we can just hang out and like lounge around and whatnot. But uh, again, be well, create a great day. And thank you so much uh, for yeah being here and allowing us to uh, hopefully share some knowledge that helps you guys out in the bike shop. So we'll see you in the lounge.